plunge holes formed by what must have been a spectacular waterfall along the course of an ancient river that flowed below the southern wall of the Laurentide ice sheet. No more than a few hundred feet wide, these lakes are almost as deep. The river that formed in central New York tumbled over the edge of this rock formation at the northern edge of the Appalachian Plateau. The waterfall that scoured them out of this limestone bedrock may have been at least as powerful as the spectacular falls at Niagara. Erosion from falling water is a powerful force. Throughout central New York, the retreating ice sheet had exposed layers of sedimentary rock with varying susceptibility to erosion. Formations that readily eroded broke down and disappeared over time, while harder, more resistant rock remained in place much longer. The Niagara River is the one and only outflow for all four western Great Lakes, Superior, Huron, Michigan, and Erie. Niagara Falls tumbles over a formation whose cap rock, or topmost layer, is composed of the seemingly indestructible mineral dolomite. But even dolomite, one of the hardest, most resistant minerals found in nature, does eventually succumb to erosion. All sorts of pressures take hold to break it down. Constant shifting of adjacent rock layers, fractures caused by freezing and thawing, and even today, thousands of years after the ice sheet melted away, the effects of upwarping, the rebounding of the Earth's crust from the crushing weight of the Laurentide. Throughout the rock layers just below the top of the falls are cracks called joints that result from all these forces at work. The network of joints below Niagara Falls is so extensive, scientists claim that nearly as much water flows through these openings into the plunge hole below as descends from the river above. When European explorers first laid startled eyes upon this cataract almost 400 years ago, the falls were retreating from erosion at a rate of about six feet per year. Only by periodically stopping the flow over parts of the falls in order to reinforce the limestone walls that support them have huge sections of rock face been prevented from collapsing into the river at the same rate. And that's only half the story. Literally, during the 20th century, much of the flow above the falls was diverted into adjacent man-made subterranean channels to drive huge turbines that generate electricity. Today, the average daily flow over Niagara Falls is about half its historical volume, even less in winter. Imagine the magnitude of water and spray, the even more deafening roar when the river was flowing freely over the Niagara Escarpment. Now imagine the same scene above Green Lake and many hundreds of years later, but just a few hundred yards further along, above Round Lake, and even later above Glacier Lake when that ancient glacial river cut its way westward. 